guys, welcome to the Debrief Live and we're looking forward to all of your questions. And uh, I know some of you are wondering, do I have a smudge on my face? No, it's a bruise because somebody elbowed me in the middle of the <laughs> night sleeping. Hitting us hard. It's a quarantine mark. So uh, actually it's not, it's just a bruise. Uh, but uh, just, just so you know, don't panic. It's not a new mole, not a new growth. It's and just I didn't a bruise. do it. <clears throat> Nice, nice. All right, so we're going to take all of your questions as they come in. If anyone, if they're good questions, we're going to try to take them in. And I know I say there's no bad questions. That's a lie. So uh, we're going to be honest today. So we're going to start with Nick. Nick's going to get us rolling. Yeah, just so glad <clears throat> that you guys are watching. Drop us your comments so that we can uh, chat with you today. Take your questions. Stephanie uh, Schaefer will actually be in the comments uh, helping field those questions. So we would love to do that. Um, but just right off the bat, how are you guys adjusting to this new normal? What's, what's, what's happening with you? Yeah, I feel like I was really good until Trump said 30 more days. Like I felt like, and I, and I knew because I've been chatting with some of my friends uh, who are in contact with people in Wuhan. And so they've been on lockdown for seven weeks, can't leave the house. Mm -hmm. So like we're able to go out for groceries, go out for a walk in, in most mm -hmm. parts of, uh, I don't think that's true in New York, but um, but here, you know, we're able to have just a little bit of freedom. But in Wuhan, uh, one of my good friends, uh, his friend was locked in an apartment, uh, a 500 square foot apartment with one window for seven weeks. And he just talked about, you know, the process of going through that. And I'm actually gonna talk a little bit about that in my message this weekend, uh, what to do when you don't know what to do. And uh, we're gonna look at Palm Sunday because not everybody responds to situations in the right way. And so we're gonna look at this weekend in the message. So don't miss this weekend. But I think for me, um, the biggest challenge has been dishes because we have we have a house full of people. And so we don't have little kids, but we have adult kids. And it's dishes for breakfast. It's dishes for lunch. It's dishes for dinner. It's dishes for snacks. And so that's been some of the conflict. And, um, you know, our kids have been in college where you eat your food and you leave your <laughs> dishes. So that's not the way that it works at home. And so I've been a little frustrated with that because I don't like being dishes dishwasher. But... The kids are trying, they're, you know, they're, they're being, they're yeah, being they're good. And it. so Tammy's kicking in. So <clears throat> I think for all of us, like we have five of us, almost adult, you know, five, almost adults. The girls are adults. Ethan's almost adult. And it's an adjustment being together all the time. Even for Matt and I, it's like, it's not you. It's not me. It's just even a lot of alone time together. Um, you know, we're lucky that we are allowed to go outside, you know, but we have been trying to make the best of it, create some new rhythms. I've tried to set a tone in our house every day of just like silly things, but things to make the house seem like a more peaceful place of like lighting candles, starting games, playing music in the house, having windows, little weird things that seem weird, but just to make the house seem Okay, yeah. you know, four of us are working right now from home. So it's like video chat this room, video chat this room. So trying to be mindful of everybody's work stuff too. And totally. Ethan's at school. It's an adjustment. It's a new adjustment. Some things have gone well. Some things are a little more challenging. But I think at the end of the day, we all feel lucky that we have the opportunity to be safer at home. You know, that we are not... Um, having to go out every day because God bless those people that do. We're grateful for that. Um, we think it's a small sacrifice to have to do, and it, it could be a lot worse than being asked to just stay at home. So yeah. I think at the end of the day, we all kind of land there with our new routines. Can you guys take off all the names off the screen? Like, don't put Nick's name, don't put my name, don't put Tammy's name. Thank you. So we got our first <clears throat> question from Tw uh, Twyla. Hi, Twyla. Thank you for uh, for chatting to us. She said, I'd love to hear more about living with adult children during this time, how to help them understand the gravity of the situation, to follow the rules without scaring them. And then Steph added the same for adults who are talking to their parents who maybe don't get the gravity of the situation. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, this is something totally new. And, and, and to be honest, you know, I, I'm frustrated uh, with our kids. Uh, they, they don't understand it. And I think that's the tension. You don't want to terrify them, but at the same time, like we, we, we took uh, my son to, one of his sons had an 18th birthday. And so we were gonna drop off a gift. And my words were to him in front of the house, drop off the gift, immediately get in the car. So I look up, he's hugging his friend at the front door and, <laughs> and they're conversing. And I'm just like, it, it, he just can't, I mean, you know, he's starving for connection mm -hmm. and this and that. And here's the thing is you, you think, oh, my friend's not sick. 
And so what's happening is friends are killing their friends and family members are killing their family members because it's this close, intimate contact and we think there's nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. And we know that this thing is spreading through parties. It's, mm -hmm. it's spreading through worship uh, connections. It's spreading through, you know, intimate contact. And what I mean by intimate, I don't mean like sexual. I just mean hugging, touching. Mm -hmm. These are your friends. And, and I'm watching people and my own family just not get it. And so we went to another birthday party yesterday where I, I was really frustrated and I told Tammy because like it, it wasn't a birthday party it was like a in your car drive by parade but I told to I told her I said there's no way our kids are staying in the car and she said they will I said it's impossible <laughs> it is yeah. impossible and I, I said I'm telling you they will not stay in the car we parked for five seconds both kids out of the car saying hi and I just sat there and I'm just like and I turned to some people in our church in a car next to us and I'm like we're all gonna die we're all going to die because people are foolish. And I know a lot of you don't like it when I they, use the word stupid. They don't have a category for this, though. And, and that's why I feel like <clears throat> they are trying the best they can. They need to be smarter and wiser. But they don't have a category for this because you look at your friends, you think they're safe, like you're a safe person to me. Mm -hmm. But right now, nobody's safe. Yeah. And you can't take that for granted. Um, I'm not in safe. That way. I could kill my own family. Like, I could do that. And I don't mean like murder <laughs> them. I mean, I mean, no, I mean like I could go out, engage with somebody, and, yeah. and people just. So I think there's two groups of people. There, there's the paranoid group of people that thought, you know, this would always come. This is the end. And then I think there's the other group of people that are like, there's nothing to this. And I'm going to be totally fine. And, and the truth is probably somewhere in the middle that we need to be cautious and we need to be careful. And we need to make sure that we're not gathering for a period of time so that the infection rate will go down. And once the infection rate goes down, I think we're all going to be okay. The problem is getting to that. And so in Wuhan, China, and I, I just hate to tell all of you this, there are advantages in living in a totalitarian, you know, dict dictatorial uh, country. And that's what China is. They locked everybody in. Nobody was out. And in seven weeks, they were done. My concern here in America is we're not taking this seriously. People are continuing to go out and walk in groups and do these things. And what that means is it, it could be 12 weeks. It could be 16 weeks. Mm -hmm. It could be three months yeah. because we're not taking this seriously. And, you know, it's really, really hard. And so we, we need to talk. And we're struggling with that because we have young people in our house that don't have self-control or they're learning to have self-control. And so isolation is very, very difficult for them. I am blessed with work. We both have work. We're still continuing to do work. I know that you're working probably more than you ever have. But for those of you who are locked at home and, and there's not a lot to do, that's what I'm going to be talking about this weekend in the message, what can you do when there's nothing to do? That's going to be one of my major uh, points uh, because we're all going to go through this, but we're not all going to, we're not all going to come out of this better. Mm. Some of you are going to come out of this worse. Some of you are going to come out of it right where you, where you are. But some of us, I think, with effort and determination and self-control, we're going to come out of this better people, ready to handle life, and with a new vigor in life and a new purpose. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about this weekend. But I would just say, especially to the seniors, yes, for the love seniors. of Jesus, the reason we're all trapped inside is because this disease primarily affects you. Mom, if you're listening, I love you. This is to you. So if you feel like this is passive aggressive, I want this to be aggressive aggressive. Stay inside, be smart, because they just don't think it's it's gonna hurt them. Because even our seniors, you know, uh, there's very few people alive that remember the Spanish flu epidemic. I, I read online, there's this one guy who was 107 years old and he actually got the Spanish flu and, and lived through it, he's 105. But I mean, you have to be like over 100 to have any experience with something like this. And um, it's just new for us. And we, we have to be very, very careful. And because it, it, can, it can affect us uh, in, a, in, a, in a way where once we get it, you don't, you don't, you don't know. Like we could get it and, you know, <laughs> we're done. Or you could get it and your body goes into overdrive to try to kill this virus. And ultimately your own immune system takes you out. So we have to be very, very cautious. And my hope and prayer is that we all take this seriously. And in four weeks or 30 days, hey, man, it's May. California is great. I know not everybody watches from California, but the weather's going to be fantastic and we can get out. But if we don't take this seriously, I'm thinking in May, the president's going to go and another lap. Yeah. So. 
Should we take this online question? Sure. It says, any advice for walking alongside a friend who is interested in reading the Bible but not attending church? I did recommend that she start in the New Testament, and she started Sunday and is already on Matthew 6. Yeah, that's great. And uh, so, so the challenge with the, the Gospel of Matthew is that it's written to Jews. And so uh, there's a lot of assumptions that the author Matthew is making. So he's assuming, you know, Jewish tradition, Jewish heritage, Jewish prophecy. So he's making a lot of assumptions there. And so <clears throat> Matthew's a great gospel, but it's not uh, <clears throat> in the same way that Luke is, where he's writing to a Gentile audience. And by Gentile, I mean non-Jewish, that's all of us. And uh, Luke doesn't make assumptions. So he explains things and talks about why things are there. So I would continue with Matthew, but if she gets confused, let her know that's why. <clears throat> that's good. Uh, Denise wrote in and she says, uh, this has been stressful on marriages, especially if they've already had issues. What are ways to navigate that? Or how or where can couples get help right now? Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I think that crisis brings out whatever problems were there, whatever cracks were in your relationship, crisis magnifies them. So crises are death, loss of job, uh, unhealth, uh, something like this. And many of us are experiencing all of those at once. And so it's exposing issues that, that were there. And so what I would do is I would look at that as a positive, a time to talk and work out these things. Because when are you going to have this kind of time? Yeah, we're, we don't have all the distractions right now. So we have you have to focus on. Yeah, and so I, I would I, I would walk through those things. I would, I would create grace for each other. Uh, avoid words like you always, you know, you never. Uh, and just try to focus on one thing. So one of the problems with arguments is they spiral out of control. And, um, you know, Tammy's personality is let's deal with all of it right now. <laughs> and I, I don't agree with her strategy. I think we need to stay focused on what this is. Because when you start lumping, you really kind of lose sight of the issue. And then you deal with generalities and, and things of all time. And I want to talk about those things when emotions aren't high and, and clarity is, is uh, spot on. Because when my emotions are high, I'm not aware of what I'm saying. Like, I can't tell you how many times Tammy and I'll have a fight and she'll say, you said, and I have no recollection. I mean, honestly, I have no recollection of what she said I said. And so my apology sounds like this. Well, if you said, say that I said it, I'm sorry. And it's not that I'm manufacturing that or not wanting to apologize when my emotions are high, my mouth gets going, and words are coming out of my mouth faster than my brain could calculate them. <laughs> and so I don't have memory of saying that. And, but it doesn't matter because it's been hurtful to her. And she doesn't, you know, she can't talk as fast as me, but she can think way faster than me. So every word that's coming out of my mouth, she's taking notes and she'll never forget that until Ever. Jesus comes. <laughs> so I would just say, hey, this is an opportunity. Yeah. I would just, if you haven't had a fight yet, I would just say, hey, it's gonna come. It's going to happen at some point in time. We're going to get on each other's nerves. So, so let's handle this. And, and don't be afraid to take personal space. Say something like, I need to take a walk by myself. Like after this debrief, I plan on going on a six-mile run. And I'm just going to go do that. And I'm going to be out by myself because I need that time to exercise my thoughts, uh, to, to get my energy out so that I can come back and do whatever she needs me to do. Uh, and, and we've had a little break from each other. And I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. So I would say... You know, I know that that question is super general. Like some people have some really, really big issues. Some are minor and this is just bringing them out. But, you know, one of the things I'm curious about is who do you want to be at the end? Like we, we're all in this another 30 days. You know, who you were is not who you have to be at the end of this. And sometimes there isn't going back and like buttoning up every single area that you're not right in your marriage. It's a time to say, let's make some new ways about us let's let's be more intentional to look at what's you know what remember what we love about each other and make some commitments about who we want to be not who we were i mean sometimes those simple resets sometimes you have to just go we're going to put a reset yeah. and and move forward in that way like yesterday sucked today's a new day let's start this day well um sometimes you just have you have to just put the past in the past and look forward and I would say, you know, I don't want to give away too much of my sermon this week, but I think a lot of us act like we're adults. Mm -hmm. And what this crisis is bringing out is just really there's a lot of immaturity in us. And Absolutely. so what a two-year-old does when they don't get what they want immediately, they lose their minds. 
And so the temptation is to revert back to who we were as a two-year-old, and we're constantly reacting to disappointment. And so I think the beauty of this is this is a great lesson for all of us on how to work through disappointment, how to work through discouragement. We're just not used to uh, not getting to do what we want. I mean, we live in a culture of immediate, never-ending gratification. And so we want that, and you know we're not getting it. And so how do I deal with the Matt Brown who's still two years old, who still wants to throw a fit when things don't go his way? And... Um, you know, uh, the other day I was working out, I, I, I built a little home gym and I whacked myself on the head with a weight because I was trying to uh, do an exercise at the gym that I couldn't exactly recreate. And so I was trying to do it and I dropped the weight on my head and my first reaction was just anger. And then I just had to laugh. It's just like, good Lord, Matt, you know, you have to laugh it off because oftentimes I think my immature response is anger and I need to just laugh at myself and be like, that was, okay, that was dumb. That was a dumb idea and it didn't work out. You know, you're not unconscious. You don't need to go to the hospital. I didn't, I didn't have a bruise. I mean, I have one here, but this is not where I whack myself. It was back here. So we yeah. can probably to think through this and post on one of our social medias, some books that might be helpful That'd to be read great. during this yeah. time as couples to try to work on your marriage. So yeah, great um, question. Thank you for yeah. your honesty. Uh, and just know this is, this is a tough situation. Uh, this just is tough. And, um, you know, uh, Tammy and I, were, uh, our last vacation, we were in Boston uh, in what, October? Mm -hmm. And we, when we were in Boston, we got a phone call that her mom was going into the hospital. And I was trying to process out loud how difficult this journey was going to be. And it, it caused her to panic and tank and it caused a fight between us. And all I was trying to do was verbalize, okay, uh, so like when I do an Ironman race, I, I try to verbalize and visualize the struggle that's ahead mm -hmm. so that I don't unravel during it. Um, there's not, nothing about an Ironman is easy. They're all difficult. They're all brutal. And so I visualize and then I verbalize. So I visualize the challenge and then I verbalize what I'm going to say to myself so that I can get through that when I want to quit, when I'm angry, when I'm upset. But what it did to her is it just completely went down. Because I, I, I visualize the worst and I verbalize my response. The worst for her just tear. So, so you have to figure out how to, how to navigate this. And so what I would say um, for me is I, I'm going to envision the worst, but I'm not going to share the worst with her. What I'm going to do is then verbalize to her. Here's how I think we can work through moderately difficult times. Because mm -hmm. um, even if I joke around, this is the end or whatever, she's like, are you serious? I'm like... <laughs> No, I'm not serious. <laughs> okay, here's a good question. What are things dating couples moving towards marriage can do to deepen their relationship with God them and themselves during a time of social distancing? This is a good one. Yeah, I would say that if you are dating, man, this is this is a gift from God for you. Yeah. Because it's going to force you to uh, have in, emotional and spiritual mm -hmm. intimacy. And if you can't do it, break up. Like if you can't mm -hmm. find conversation through FaceTime, if you can't talk about anything spiritual, that is God's gift to you. Get out of the relationship. Because listen to me, it's not all about sexual intimacy, okay? We've not been having a lot of sexual intimacy. A lot of alone time, not a lot of sexual intimacy, okay? So just, just, just and every married couple is going. stressed, you guys. Yeah, stress does not. Well, I think for guys, stress does some things. But for girls, that's not, they're not like, yeah, let's go. So, so just know, this is a time to work through real issues and um, sexual intimacy, especially in dating, is oftentimes a cover to blind mm -hmm. you to the emotional and spiritual problems that you have. Yeah. And so um, that's what I would say is, yeah. is work through talking. Um, man, if you haven't had a fight, start one. Just figure out how figure out how to <laughs> navigate that, you know, through social media, you know, by FaceTiming or Zoom or whatever it is that you're using. But uh, but really, really talk through things and talk about how this is making you feel. This is, this is such a gift because how a person responds through discouragement, uh, through isolation, that is such a beautiful picture of what they're going to do when marriage is tough. And you're going to get to see this. And I would just say, this is great. Some of you who are married, you're like, wow, I'm learning this about my spouse and I had no idea. So if you're dating, this is a home run for you. Really, really take this time. And, and physical distance is a good time because it, it, it's going to make you realize, can I live without this person? I mean, it's yeah. a gift. So. Yeah.
Yeah, me and my wife, we spent a year apart. Uh, we were dating for like eight years and then we broke up for a year. She moved to Los Angeles and I was still in Texas. And after that time, we were able to connect and have conversations. And it was so healthy for us that mm -hmm. when she moved back, we, we knew like the next step was marriage. And so taking that time apart uh, yeah. is, is- Did you just say you dated for eight years? We did, yeah. Eight years. You kind of just threw that out like it yeah. was just a non-essential, but that's yeah, I tried a long to, I tried time to What are you like, Jacob and she's Leah? What, <laughs> it was a deal. Yeah. So if you guys don't know the Bible story, Jacob, he had to work for seven years to marry Rachel, and then he got drunk at his wedding night and woke up the next morning with the wrong woman, which is not I, what I'm that's saying not, you did. I did not do But that. they did date for seven years in that story. That's why you guys need to read the Bible. There's really, really cool stories. Nick, let's do this question. This is a yeah. good one. Yeah. What do you say to those people in our lives who want to be their own news channel, sharing facts with us about the virus and predicting what to do? What's to come for us and our country? It creates anxiety for me personally, and usually it's not even real data. That is a great question because that's that's a real thing happening. Yeah, is out that there. just come in? Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Whoever true. sent that in, listen. You, that is that is like the greatest debrief question of yeah. all time. You're a home run. You get a special plaque in the debrief room. We're gonna ring the bell Touchdown, for you. Jesus <laughs> loves your question. That's what most people do. So even like when there's a crisis in our church, like a car accident, somebody gets cancer, somebody's going through a divorce, somebody's uh, had an affair. People share the details of the event like a news reporter, and they talk about the event. They never pray for the people involved in the event. Mm -hmm. That's just a human response. We turn to gossip and news. And if you go back two weeks ago, I talked about don't share uh, gossip, don't share rumor. And man, I got a text message uh, from a pastor friend of mine. And it was, it was like the most negative, the worst information like possible. And I didn't even share it with Tammy. And I preached my own message to myself so I could go to sleep. Because basically their text message was, this is the end. We're, it's all over, and here's the reasons why. And I just had to, I just had to walk it back, and everything that he shared has turned out not to be true. And he was just relaying secondhand information from someone who overheard a conversation. Now he meant well, he meant well, he loves me, but that could have sunk me. And so I just had to walk. I, that's the weirdest thing, you guys, to listen to your own sermon and be like, okay, I have to listen to what the pastor said, even though that's me. And I had to preach it to myself, and so. The but, last thing, it creates anxiety for me personally, and it's usually not even real, real data. A lot of this isn't real, and it's it's rumor, and, uh, you know, we, we have a real problem in our society. It's just media is not media. It's owned by six corporations, and, and really what they want to do, they all have an agenda, and that's to keep us watching, and one of the major ways they do that is they scare us, and we, we need to not do that, and... Uh, we, we, we need we need our media to have a come to Jesus moment where they go, you know what, we're actually going to begin relaying information to people. And I think that's important. So what I would just do is, is it causes you anxiety. What I would say is what they are doing is they're processing their own anxiety. And so the way that they're dealing with it is they're just relaying information or what they've heard or what they've read. And what I would say is they're not being productive. It's not productive to track stats and, and a lot of stuff's not even accurate and to do all that. And, and, and man, if you're a five on the Enneagram, you're just, you know, you're studying all this virological, you know, charts and graphs and figuring it all out. Nobody knows where this is going. What we need to do is we need to be loving towards each other. And so what I would just say is tell the person, when you give me this information, it makes me anxious. Yeah, it's okay to say that. Yeah, yeah please don't. Yeah. Please don't do that. And, and what it just shows is, you know, they need to learn it talking about something else. We had uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a friend uh, of my, my daughter's boyfriend's sister came to visit us right when this whole thing was kind of uh, going off. Yeah. And it was so funny. They made a tent in my daughter's bedroom. And so the, the, <laughs> the 20 year olds, <laughs> 20 year olds made a tent and it was my daughter, her boyfriend and his 18 year old sister. And I said, what are you guys doing? And they said, no one is allowed to talk about coronavirus in this tent. <laughs> it is a coronavirus free zone. And I thought it was they, so they cute. They just had too much information yeah. at that yeah. time and they felt stressed and so they wanted a safe place. And I think that's okay to say like, I love you and I trust you, but I, I'm trying to keep it together. And the more I'm getting, the more anxious I'm getting. And so I, I need you to like, just like help me not yeah. be stressed by not telling me. It's okay to put that boundary in place. Yeah, and I would just say this, That's you're probably, a classic Tammy and Matt Brown. So Matt Brown processes verbally, 
before he thinks about it. So I say words out loud and words are pictures for me to try to extrapolate meaning. When I say words for her, she thinks it's a finished product and it terrifies her. And so that's what I would say to you is, hey, you're scaring. I would use these words, you're scaring me and I don't like it when you do that. So please stop. Mm -hmm. You know, go in your little chat rooms with all your, you know, your other paranoid people and and do that. And, and, uh, you know, just so you know, uh, I have a friend who I literally refer to as my paranoid friend. And when I call him and he doesn't answer, I say, hey, this is your friend. I'm calling my paranoid friend because he he's scared to death. He won't even have a voicemail. Okay. So I always just leave a message to my paranoid friend. And sometimes he'll call me back and say, hey, it was your paranoid friend calling you back. And just know that's how some people are. Great question. Yeah. Got one from Jenna. Jenna says, what are your thoughts on finding balance between using social media to stay connected and having time with the screen on? Like, what's that balance in this time? Because we have lots of time on our hands. Yeah, um, I've really monitored it, you know, uh, so I don't know about your guys' phones, but mine calculates my weekly usage. And mine actually said, hey, you're down uh, 20% this week. Good job. That's weird when your computer is... up. Hey, you're up 6% this week. Yeah, my computer's like, great job. And so I just realized this isn't healthy for me. And um, I think we're all drawn to certain things. And here's what I know about me. When I spend too much time on my phone, I am drawn to things that are not good for me. So some of you, that's pornography. For some of you, that's Instagram. Um, I I was uh, praying with a pastor last night, and this is what he told me. He said, I'm spending all my time watching all the other churches hit it out of the park. And I'm thinking about my people in my church and they realize I'm not as good as everybody else. That's a pastor. So he, so think about this. He's watching other churches sermons, other churches worship services, and that's not good for him. And I just told him, I said, listen, it doesn't matter what every other church is doing. It matters what God's called you to do. And you need to be faithful to that. And, and, and you need to reach the people that you're reaching. That's one of the reasons I'm trying not to, and you know, we've had, we've had some pretty incredible numbers. I'm not trying to put that out there because I know that there are a lot of small church pastors that follow us. And I know that that's gonna be, that's gonna be painful for them and that's gonna be hurtful for them. And so I, I made that decision. You know, some churches are like, we, you know, we, we reached a million people this weekend. And hey man, that's great. But some churches can't even get their social media platform going. There are some churches that haven't met since this crisis started. Mm -hmm. I've got friends that don't know how to collect an offering. I've got friends, you know, a lot of churches aren't going to survive this process. And so my my heart goes out for them. And so I would say this, that you really got to watch what you're looking at. I I, I feel like I am overly focused on the stock market. I feel like that's kind of my pornography right now. I just, I'm just watching (laughs) this uh, because we have money in the stock market. And so I'm up, I'm down, I'm okay, I'm not okay. And I've realized, okay, I just have to push this aside and I got to focus on God and not the stock market. Uh, But some of you guys, you know, you're, when you don't know what to do, usually you do what you shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I would say, I would put that down. We've been playing uh, Minecraft. Is that the name of the game? No, not Minecraft. Mastermind. Mastermind. Minecraft is like a. So Mastermind is she, Tammy's, I don't know what it is, but she loves games from the eighties. So we've been playing Yahtzee. We've been playing, (laughs) what's the name of the game? Mastermind. Mastermind. And so. It's games where we're interacting with each other mm-hmm. and we're- and My we're, kids are into it Yeah, now. and we've been playing that yeah. and we've been doing things where we're connecting with each other. So we might watch a movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I realized th- the first week of this crisis, I binged on Netflix and I watched The Kingdom. Uh, if you're looking for a show that's in Korean, it's fantastic. <laughs> Um, I absolutely <laughs> love it. Everybody looking for that right now. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, it has subtitles, but it's, it's uh, like 60 or 18th century uh, uh, Korea. And they're battling zombies. What else could you wow. ask for? Matt's been in dreamland. And I, I binge the whole thing. <laughs> so um, no it. sex, right? No, no nudity. So if you're disappointed, pray about that. Um, <laughs> but I loved it. Lots of gore, lots of killing. But it's okay because they're zombies. So it doesn't violate the Ten Commandments because they're already say, dead. Yeah, I would say for me and, and what I'm trying to help our son with is... Just like figuring out a healthy balance. You know, before I was checking all the time, like a lot of you might be, um, I, I am helping with some things online for works. So I'm trying to make sure that I get on and then get off for periods of time. Like 
this last few days uh, or this last week, what I've been trying to work on is like when the sun's out, I'm trying to not be on social media yeah. Yeah, um, so that I can be, I'm, I'm taking the time to get anything done around the house that I haven't, like drawers cleaned out, refrigerators cleaned out, things thrown out, things organized, because I never have the time to do those things. So I'm trying to make sure I pick a project for the day and until that's done, I'm not getting online. And then once I, like once it's dinner time, having family time, you know, and so I'm, I'm picking big windows of time where I try to not touch my phone. Yeah. Um, so, but you brought up looking at things you shouldn't, and I know there's a really good question about yeah. that. So uh, Uberfax is kind of like Ripley's Believe It or Not and Guinness Book of World Records on Twitter, if you can imagine those things. And they're reporting that the largest porn companies are seeing 11% increase in all activity on the internet being pornography. Um, what does that say about our world? And, and what do you say to somebody who's struggling with porn, especially in this time? Yeah, what I would say, I, I think pornography for most of us is the low hanging fruit in terms of drugs. So m mm. most of you are, are you're not going to turn to marijuana. You're not going to start smoking cigarettes. A lot of you don't even drink coffee. I know that's hard to believe, but a lot of people don't drink coffee. Um, you know, most of you aren't going to try heroin, you know, during this time, you're not going to go, you know what, meth is going to get me through you know, this crisis. And so pornography becomes that low hanging fruit where, you know, uh, maybe it's, it, it wasn't even, you know, you, you weren't even trying to do it. Like the last time I viewed pornography, um, I was looking for uh, something on the Lakers and I was trying to find the Lakers draft pick order. This was maybe a year ago. And I, what I saw you guys was, it was, it was horrific. And I panicked and I hit, uh, what's the button where you go to the last page you try to go backwards mm -hmm. um so i hit that well the site then kicked you to another porn site i hit it again then it's another porn site and then i just went to tammy and i said look i need you to delete this from my computer because i can't get out of this but it was it was awful and for someone like me um that had an issue with pornography it really was unsettling and I remember specifically, uh, Tammy's dad was an alcoholic and he was sober for 10 years, mm -hmm. nine or 10 years. And I'll never forget this. Uh, I had some mouthwash and we were camping together and we were brushing our teeth. I think we were camping. So we were brushing our teeth at a campsite. And I said, do you want some mouthwash? And he said, no. He said, um, th th most mouthwashes have alcohol in it. And I looked at it and it said alcohol free. And so I gave him a swig. I'll never forget the look on his face. His eyes lit up and he spit it out and he almost started crying. And I said, what? And he said, he said, there's alcohol in that. And I looked and at the fine print, it said may contain less than 0.02% of alcohol. Wow. He was such an addict to alcohol that his brain could sense that alcohol at that level mm -hmm. and it scared him. And so here's what I would say to you. If you're a recovering porn addict or you're recovering or, you know, you're just trying to live porn free. Don't give yourself even a sliver of opportunity to get into that. Because what it did when I, when I saw that, even though I didn't mean to, even though I didn't want to, it sent me to a place in my mind where I went back to what it used to be like when I would look at that. And it was very unsettling. It brought back, I don't even think I shared this with Tammy, but it brought back some, some unhealthy memories, some sinful thoughts, and I had to mm -hmm. process that. And for me, even with prayer, even with confession, it takes about five days for me to get something completely out of my mind. <clears throat> so, so I would give yourself grace there. So what I would do is just say, I'm not, I'm not going to look at my phone when I'm by myself. I, I'm going to uh, get in an accountability group immediately. Um, if I look at something I, I'm not going to look at, I'm going to tell my wife, or I shouldn't look at, I'm going to tell my wife, I'm going to tell my friends. Um, you know, um, what do you say to people that are turning to it because it's such an increase as a way to numb or avoid what's happening? Well, I think, yeah, I think th th there's multiple reasons. And yeah. so that's what I would look at is wh why, why do I have the desire? Okay, listen to me. If you have kids watching, please, hopefully they're not by now. But, but I would say, wh why do I want to watch someone else have sex? Like what, 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 what is it about me that wants to watch someone else engage in intimacy or, or someone else, else, uh, self sexually soothe, right? Um, what, what is it about me that, that feels like that's okay? And then I would really go there. 
and, and not to shame yourself or make yourself feel guilty, but be like, you know, um, w what's going on there? And so I think with married couples, if one of you is struggling with this, uh, there's probably some tension in the house. So there's not, there's not sexual intimacy. So you're mad at your spouse. And so you're going to give yourself permission because your spouse is not a willing partner. And you're going to go to this 24 seven lie and what the woman or the man or whatever it is that you're wanting to see is lying. They're telling you that they're into you and they're giving you this picture that they desire you. And the truth is they want your money or the truth is in some weird way, they get off on being viewed and that's their own issue. But either way, listen to me, it's not about you. Pornography is never about you and it is never about their desire for you. It is about either their desire to be seen, their desire to be affirmed or their desire to make money. So, so the first lie with pornography is they're into me. That is a lie. It is not true. And so I would go to your spouse and say, hey, I'm really tempted to look at porn. I feel like we're not connecting sexually. Um, now, here's the thing is, I think guys, sometimes when we get an anxious, what we want to do is have sex. That's maybe not how your wife is. And so you have to come to a happy medium. And what that is, is I value Tammy. I care about Tammy. And so we need to, we need to figure this out together and talk about that and have realistic expectations for what that's going to look like. Our house is also full of adult children. That's not fun. You know, that's not fun. And they, they stay up way later than we can. We cannot outstay, you know, they can, they can outlast us at night. So we can't wait for them to go to bed like you can when they're little or you just tell them to go to bed. Um, so, so I would just be really, really honest with that. And I, first I would talk to God and say, God, I need your strength. The next thing I would do is I would confess it to a brother or, or sister in Christ, someone in your community group. And again, if you're not a community group, this is why you need to be in group. Some of you feel really disconnected from church. And so my question would be, are you connected to a community group? First thing I did this morning when we got up is I FaceTimed somebody in my community group. And I said, hey, I just want to see your face. Just want to talk to you. It's another guy in my group. I said, here's what's going on. Um, you know, and I just wanted to connect with him. So I still feel connected uh, to the church because I'm connected to my, my community group. Yeah. And so if I would say if you're looking to join uh, an online group, uh, we have some resources for you. If you want to talk to somebody specifically, you can go to move.sc slash help to connect with our soul care. And soul care just launched uh, online care groups, and you can find those at move.sc slash online care groups. Oh, that's good. And I would just say this about pornography. My hope in our church is that we would, we would feel no more guilty about sharing our, our struggle with pornography than we would say, I'm struggling with anxiety, or I'm struggling with fear, or I'm struggling with faith. I, I want you to know that we all struggle with sin and it's just in different ways. And so I just hope that you can find the freedom. Jesus said the truth will set you free. And the first step to healing is just getting real and saying, this is an issue for me. And some people might think it's gross. I want you to know, I, I, I mean, I, th I mean, not gross, but they might think you're gross, right? So pornography is gross, but it doesn't make you gross. It's something that you're doing. It's not who you are. And you need to separate those things. And I want you to know that, um, you know, I'm going to challenge you, but I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to help you. And I'm here to help you to live the life God's called you to live. And so... And it doesn't mean mm. you necessarily... I mean, every group's different with different dynamics. So you may find someone in the group that you can be real with. We want you to be real. You don't have to be real with everyone, everyone but you need to yeah. be real with someone. And so that might be an alternative in that. Let's do this question that's up here because we've actually been getting text this often. It says, I realize that time with Jesus is a non-negotiable daily, daily, but in times like this, even more so, do you recommend reading a book of the Bible in its entirety or would you encourage bites from different books? It just depends on which book it is. So books like uh, uh, 1 and 2 Corinthians, there, there are segments that are awesome and then there are sections that are brutally boring. Like, I don't know that there's anything more boring than maybe the first six or seven chapters of, excuse me, First Chronicles. What did I say? Corinthians. Yeah. Corinthians is great. That's an entertaining book from start to finish. Uh, first Chronicles, mm -hmm. which is really the retelling of First and Second Kings. So I tell people First and Second Kings is the TMZ version of uh, Israel history. So that's got like Bathsheba, <laughs> affairs, killing, whatever. TMZ. No, it is. And then uh, First and Second Chronicles is like the press release from the White House version of what happened. <laughs> so, you know, um, 
What book do you think, if you had to throw a book out or two for people to really meditate on during a time like this, what would you say? I, my, my favorite book, and I'm, I'm biased, and uh, you know, they're all important, but it's biased Hebrews. Uh, the, the, the book of Hebrews takes you right from who Jesus is to what Jesus does to what you need to do, mm-hmm. and it does it in just a few chapters. So there's just 13 chapters in the book of Hebrews. Uh, if you don't know your Hebrew Bible, your Jewish history, you might be a little lost. Um, but I would, I would just sit in Hebrews because Hebrews, I think, gives the fullness of the gospel. And it's not as theologically confusing to me as Romans. I think Romans is mo- not confusing. Romans is more theologically challenging to me than Hebrews. And I think Hebrews gives you a, a more full picture. But if, if I didn't pick Hebrews, I would go to Romans uh, if you're feeling depressed and discouraged, I would read Philippians. Um, you know, if you're feeling isolated and alone, I would read uh, Ephesians. So if I'm feeling isolated, I would read Ephesians, depressed, Philippians. Mm-hmm. If I want to grow in my understanding of the whole Bible, Hebrews. If I really want to understand what God is doing theologically, Romans. Um, and of course, the Gospels are, are always great. Um, and if you're not a good reader, start in Mark. It's the shortest Gospel. Uh, it has a problem ending because we're not exactly sure uh, how the gospel ends. Um, read Luke Acts. So I, so I would stay there. Um, if you've got some more time, read Genesis. If I was going to do the Old Testament, I would read Genesis, the first half of Exodus, selected portions of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then I would go straight uh, to 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings. We're getting seminary right now. Kings. We are. So I would read those books. Man, if you read those books in the Old Testament, you're going to know almost everything you need to know about the Hebrew uh, history in order to understand Christianity. Um, That's so. good, Matt Brown. Yeah. You did have a great series, 252, that kind of goes yeah. through Luke and Acts, which yeah. is, it's really yeah, nice. Yeah, so that walks you right through uh, 52 uh, sermons on the book of Luke, the book of Acts, and then, of course, we have the debrief episodes where we kind of mm-hmm. go a little bit deeper. Uh, so if you're not a reader, I would go there. It's so. really good. That's good. Awesome. What else you got for us? Uh, I think we ha- have time for one more question, and this came in a while ago. It was a, it was for Fredo, and this is from Summer, and she said, I heard Fredo say in a recent sermon that friends are one of the most vital things to have, but yet I have none. For some reason, I don't have friends. She gives some details, but says, I don't seem to attract people who are interested in being part of my life other than my husband. Mm-hmm. And because of that, I feel like I sab- sabotage potential friendships because I get too much in my head and begin to think, will they find me interesting? Um, so she looks for ways and she thinks, will they find me interesting? Will I push them away? Um, do you have any advice for somebody in this time who is looking to connect with friends? Yeah, I would say right now is probably a really tough time to connect with friends. What I would encourage you to do as soon as you can is meet with a counselor and just, and just work with a counselor on maybe some things that you're doing that repel people. And so obviously there's a longing for you, um, to have friends. And I think one of the most difficult uh, moments in anyone's life is when they get real with themselves and they realize there's some things about them that are not very lovable, that are not likable. Uh, Especially a lot of our parents, you're doing your children a huge disservice by saying there's nothing wrong with you. You're perfect. You're wonderful. You're exactly the way God made you to be. That is, that is not a good message to give to your children because what they're going to discover is that's not true. There are things that are wrong with them. There are areas that where they need to grow, and there is work that needs to be done. The Bible just says none of it's physical, right? God doesn't care about how we look physically. Obviously, I mean, look at us. We look very differently. Um, so I, I think that was the hardest moment for me. Uh, I, I lived, I would say, the first 25 years of my life oblivious to why some people were repelled by me for 25 years. Now, and that's not actually true because I was cute when I was little. But say, let's say seventh grade to 25. And so some people loved me and some people could not stand me. And the mistake I made until I was 25 years old is I always assumed that the problem was with other people. And so obviously, Tammy, uh, one of the big moments for us was one of those fights where I said this, why does the whole world think I'm awesome, which wasn't true except for you, and she said, because no one knows the real you. And that was the first moment where, and that was an ugly fight, and it was a very painful moment. Um, 
Sorry about that. That's okay. I, I <laughs> needed it. And, and that's the thing is being real with yourself is brutal, but it sets you free. Mm -hmm. And I had to look at myself. So that was one moment. Another moment was when uh, this counselor, so she's a PhD in counseling. And she said to me, she said, you're a close talker. And I don't like that. And then I started to realize, you know, and if any of you knows me personally, you know that I, I get really, really up in your business when we talk. Um, I've only met like two people in my life that are more close talkers than I am. And one of them was Vice President Mike Pence. That dude was in my kitchen when we <laughs> talked. I mean, he was in my face and he didn't blink. Mike wow. Pence was, yeah, I mean, he was up in my, my grill when we were in D.C. I couldn't believe it. He never blinked. He just looked at me and as we talked. But... Um, and then I realized my personality, um, you know, me having to be the center of attention all the time. And I had to look at those things and realize I wasn't a good friend. I wasn't a good friend to people. Um, I lost my best friend in college. Uh, we were roommates for two years. We don't even speak now. Some of that was what he did, but a lot of it was who I was. And so I, don't be afraid to look at your sin. Don't be afraid. Because God sees your sin and he still loves you. So what we all want is the same eyes that God sees. And we want to look at ourselves. And, um, you know, Tammy and I, we did yoga last night on uh, on your, what's that? Peloton. On your Peloton. And, and I really, really liked it because it wasn't religious. So anytime, you know, yoga instructors get religious, I don't agree with hardly anything that comes out of their mouths until the very end. And they, yoga instructors always say that, you know, the answers are within. Everything you need is right here. And I'm like, this is, that's a bunch of crap. Like this is, that is just not the truth. Um, you know, the problem is within, the answer is above. Mm -hmm. And so what I need is God. And, uh, you know, there is such thing as a right. There is such thing as a wrong. And sometimes we do need to feel guilty because we've done something wrong. And so I would just say, okay, I'm going to work out with a counselor. I would not do this. Don't ask your husband what's wrong with me. Uh, you know, we had one of those moments yesterday where Tammy asked me a question and I was like, I am not answering that. I am running for the street because th there's nothing good that can come from me even trying to answer your question. And, um, you know, it's, she can share with it on cultivate what she said at some point in time, but it's just like, there are some questions guys, your wives ask where there's no good answers and you just run and don't trust them when they say you can be honest because that is not true. You just Rough well, sleep. I think we're different friends to our spouse than we are yeah. to other friends. So I think this could be an opportunity. Maybe you don't feel like you have close friends, but you probably feel like there's some people in your life. Um, I think one of the ways that I work on being a better friend is I try to be the friend to people that I want. And so I would use this time to maybe text a couple people in your life and tell them what you like about them. I would spend some time thinking about the friends that you like or people you know and what you admire about them and ways you can start practicing that yourself towards others. I think that's a way to become a better friend. I think you can um, maybe press into learning what your Enneagram style is and take a look at what that comes out like when you're unhealthy because when you don't feel safe, secure, loved, which you obviously don't feel safe in friendship, you know, those, those negative unhealthy qualities can come out. If you're a one, you might be more passive aggressive and judgmental, a two controlling, you know, a three line, you know. Um, so I would press into maybe spending this time right now thinking through what your primary Enneagram styles are and, and how, the, how the down unhealthy side of those might affect other people and how you can work towards getting healthier in those. Um, so I think there are some things to do that you can be a friend, even though you feel like you don't have a friend. Who can you be a friend to? No strings attached. Um, a friend of mine um, was reading a book, and I joined her in it. It's called Grown Up Girlfriends. Um, it's by Gary Smalley's daughter-in-law. He did the. He wrote some marriage books, but it's actually been so good for me, even at 46 years old, of thinking through different aspects of friendship. It's helped me lower my expectations for some, value others, but it's called Grown Up Girlfriends. It has been one of the best books on friendships that I have read, so order it, spend this time at home reading, and, and work on the friends you are and spend less time thinking about the, the friends you have or don't have. 
Yeah, and here's a, one of the other painful things that I learned about myself was that I would let go of friends who weren't cool when I found someone that was cooler. Mm. And I see that a lot. Um, a lot of people in our church that are lonely, what they really want is they want friends that they think will help them climb mm. rather than thanking God for the friends that they have. Mm. My closest friends, the people that matter to me the most, are not famous. They're not, they're not mm -hmm. millionaires. They're normal, everyday people that I love, that God has placed in my life. And, um, you know, I know very successful people, but they're not my friends. That's not who I'm, I'm reaching for. And what I've seen in my life is the people who are always reaching really don't have anybody. They don't have friends. And um, they're I, a mile wide. Yeah, they're a mile inch, wide and an inch deep. deep and I do deep. not want to be that person. Yeah. I want to have real friends. And so that means I pursue everyday, normal people. Um, because th those are the people that I, you know, are going to be there for you and going to be there with you. And um, I just think that there's value um, and there's beauty in ordinary. I just think yeah. there is. And so what Instagram does is it we're following, you know, all these extraordinary, you know, famous people and they're not saying anything or, or, or doing anything. And like we were watching TV the other night, which I'm, I'm just not a TV watcher. Um, and it was, the, it was the Kardashians commercial and they were fighting. And I think one of the girls shoved one of the other ones. And I, I, I turned to Tammy and I was like, I just, I don't get it. I, I don't get it. Now she doesn't get sports, but you know, so we're different, but we got to be careful that we don't just value what people say is valuable. Yeah. Or want to be seen with people yeah. that you think are important. Yeah. Um, I know we both have had that and we can feel it sometimes even with us in our being the pastors of our church, like we can feel immediately if people are wanting to be friends with us because they want to feel important, mm -hmm. which yeah. is typically a letdown for people. <laughs> Sorry yeah. about that. But, um, you know, I think that people who do that, also people who, um, if you can never have someone challenge you or speak a hard truth to you, then then you're not going to develop good friendships. You know, some of our closest friends have been more real and truthful with me, but I know it's because they love me and they want the best for me. So, like, are you a person that can hear people tell you, hey, this thing is hard, you know, that ironing, sharpening iron. And so being a friend and friendships are hard and they take work and they take intentionality and they take growth on all ends. Sometimes you're friends with people for all kinds of different reasons, whether it's life circumstance or season, and that's okay. Yeah. Um, but friendships are work. Yeah. And if you want to have good friends, you have to be a good friend. And you also have to be pursuing being the healthiest version of who God made you to be. Once you're doing that, I think friendships come more naturally because you know who you are. It'll help other people yeah. know who you are. You'll know the kind of friends that are good for you and healthy, and you know the kind of friends that you need to show kindness to, but there's probably boundaries with. So you, all of us being the healthiest version of who we are, out of that is an outpouring of the healthiest friendships. And and I think the mistake people make is that more friends is better. Mm -hmm. I think less friends but better ones is better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys so much for your time and just, you know, just spending time with our audience and being yeah. live and taking these questions. Thank you to our audience for all the questions that you've uh, asked today. If you want to continue to ask more, mm -hmm. you can do that by visiting debrief.show. There's an Ask Pastor Matt button there so they can ask some more questions. Yeah, and let me just say, we didn't get to everybody's questions, so I don't want you to feel like your question wasn't important. We couldn't. We just couldn't get to every question with the time that we have. And just know that we love you. We're praying for you. Stay safe. Stay wise. And, uh, you know, ask whatever you can. And we're going to try to do the debrief as long as we can to get to your questions and your issues. And... Uh, be thinking and praying about people that you can invite to the weekend service and, and connect them. Oh, Easter, Easter service. So Easter service is coming up, what, in good. 10 we days? We have Good Friday and Easter yeah. coming up. Yeah. So love you guys. Thank you. God bless.